Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the uh, third day of this conference. And it's a pleasure to introduce the first speaker today, Nati Seiberg from the Institute in Princeton, telling us about anomalies in the space of coupling constants. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. This is my first time. Can you hear me? There's some kind of feedback. That's good. Uh, it's my first time in string math. Uh, I'm really excited about it. It's nice to see this fruitful interaction between people from different disciplines. So I'll be talking about two papers written with these co-authors. Some of them are officially physicists. Other, particular Dan, is officially a mathematician. So this is really in the spirit of this conference. And these are two papers we put out in May. And the, it is very common in physics to view a quantum field theory not in isolation, but as a function of the parameter space in the theory or the, as a function of the coupling constants. And this has a very long history. And I wrote one example here is the study of Berry phase. And this has two complementary applications, and I will study both of them. One is that we vary the coupling constant, and we ask what happens to the theory as we vary the coupling constant. And this will be particularly interesting when the parameter space is topologically non-trivial, because then as we come back, we might not come back to where we started, even though it looks like we come back to where we started. The second complementary application is that we can make the coupling constant position dependent. So we can let the parameter, which appears in the Lagrangian, which we call coupling constant, which means it's a constant, so it will not be a constant. It's going to depend in space. And for example, we can have some kind of what we call an interface where the parameter in half of space has one value. In the other half of space, it has another value. And in between, there is an interface, which can be interesting. And we'll talk a lot about that. So more generally, we shouldn't just make the coupling constant space dependent or background fields. If there is a global symmetry in the problem, we should couple it to a background gauge field. This is very common. And we view the theory as a function, or as a functional, of the background gauge field. And I'll have a lot more to say about that. Also, we can, even though we are interested in a theory in Rn, this is what we're really interested in, we could study the theory on arbitrary manifold. It might not be non-orientable, or we might need to specify spin structure, or these might not be spin manifolds. All these options are there. And all of these are different probes of the underlying theory. So even though we are interested ultimately in the theory in Rn, like we have an experiment and the laboratory is in R3, in space is R3, it makes sense and it will end up being very useful to study the theory on other manifolds. Also related to that, I've already mentioned these interfaces where parameters vary or we have non-trivial backgrounds for various gauge fields. So we'll be interested in studying these defects. So we will discuss anomalies in this large space of couplings. So first, a few words, what's an anomaly? So we are interested, say, in the partition function. And the partition function is, in general, not a function. It's a section of a line bundle, which means that if we couple, say, the system to background gauge field, the partition function, for example, the determinant of the Dirac operator, is not a function of the background field. It's not gauge invariant. And it's common to describe the anomaly by a higher dimensional classical field theory, also known as invertible topological field theory, one dimension higher, which captures the anomaly. In other words, the partition function is not gauge invariant, but the variation of the partition function is a local functional. And that variation, which is a local functional, is also the variation of a higher dimensional field theory. And we'll see examples of that later. Although this was in some sense understood earlier, the first person to put it real, to good use is at Hooft in his famous 79 Carges lectures. And he showed how the fact that the partition function is not gauge invariant is an intrinsic property of the theory. It's not a disease. There's nothing wrong with that. It's an intrinsic property of the theory, and it can be used to deduce dynamical consequences. For example, the theory must have massless excitations. The theory must have a, cannot be gapped, and so forth. And we'll see examples of that later. It's also useful in dualities 
and we might also see examples of that. The second application is when the coupling constants vary. So we'll, whenever in this talk we'll have an anomaly like this, it will have two applications. One, to study what the theory does dynamically at long distances, are the phase transitions, what are the low-lying excitations, and so forth. And the second complementary application is for these defects is parameters change in space. And as a result of these anomalies, the theory on the defect could be highly non-trivial, even when the theory in the bulk is trivial. So we have some field theory. It becomes strongly coupled. It's very complicated. It's gapped in space everywhere. Except along the defect, there might be something non-trivial reflecting this underlying anomaly. Now, I put a comment here that for people who are more experts, it would look like what I'm doing here uh, repeats things that you know. In fact, it will do a lot of things that you know, but I'll do that from a modern perspective that unifies and streamlines some known results. This is related to a conflict I had in writing this talk. I had two views what I could do. One was to describe the power of these new methods to address prob new problems that uh, were not addressed before and getting, gaining new dynamical information about field theories. The alternative was to go through well-studied, almost trivial examples where you can really solve with elementary methods. You don't need this more powerful machinery. It would be kind of overkill. But we can demonstrate the machinery on a solvable system and yesterday at dinner, I was convinced that it's better to go the second route, namely ignore the more sophisticated applications. And you will just have to trust me that the more sophisticated applications do exist. And instead, stick to elementary examples where elementary examples where these new methods can be demonstrated. But then you might say, why bother with these new methods? I can just solve the system. I know everything there is to know. So this would be viewed only as a pedagogical trick. Oops, something doesn't work. OK, so as I said, this will streamline a lot of things. And we'll start by studying a simple quantum mechanical system. This is one of my favorite quantum mechanical systems. It's a wonderful example of many, many different phenomena. And then we'll switch to two-dimensional U1 gauge theory. This will also be very well known. And then there will be some new results, although not all of them about four-dimensional gauge theories. And depending on how time goes, I might skip that. And in the end, we'll make some comments about three four-dimensional fermions. And we'll see how some known results can appear as consequences of this new perspective. So finally, after talking here for so long, I'm going to start with my, one of my favorite quantum mechanical system. This is a particle on a circle. So the Lagrangian is this. I'm in Euclidean space. Q is the coordinate. It is 2 pi periodic. This system was beaten to death over the years. The spectrum can be analyzed. Exactly. This is the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. There are n infinitely many states labeled by an integer n. And this term, the integral of q dot, if Euclidean time is a circle, the integral of q dot measures the winding number around the circle, so that's an integer. And as a result, theta is 2 pi periodic. And indeed, if we look at the spectrum, if we shift theta by 2 pi, every particular state is not mapped to itself. But instead, the whole spectrum is mapped to itself by rearrangement. This rearrangement will be the hero of today's story. So when we analyze a system, the first thing to ask ourselves is what are the global symmetries? So first we have a U1 global symmetry. We can shift Q by a constant. This is clearly a symmetry of the system. We also have time reversal that flips the direction of time, or more generally, it's orientation reversal with a minus sign. I need the minus sign here so that this term will be invariant. And when theta is a multiple of pi, there is also a symmetry we can call charge conjugation, which maps q to minus q. And this c, this z2 of charge conjugation, combined with this u1 to be o2. 
But that's only the case when theta is an integer multiple of pi. That's not true for generic values of pi or generic values of theta. Now, when theta is an even multiple of pi, then things are very simple. But when theta is an odd multiple of pi, the Hilbert space is in the projective representation of this O2. Now, in quantum mechanics, it's well known from the time of Wigner that when they have a classical symmetry G, the Hilbert space might be in a projective representation of G, which is always very surprising. And this is the quantum mechanical manifestation of what in higher dimensions called an anomaly. So in, in quantum mechanics, anomalies are pre, uh, nothing but this fact that the Hilbert space can be in a projective representation of the global symmetry. And this can be interpreted as an anomaly between this charge conjugation symmetry in U1 and as we will soon see, and this anomaly mixes, it, it guarantees level crossing. So if you substitute here, so let's theta be pi, and let's compare n equals one and n equals zero. For n equals, for generic theta, no two states have the same energy. This follows from the formula. But when theta is pi, the states are doubly degenerate. There are two states at each energy, and the fact that there are two states there is, at first sight, might be surprising because in quantum mechanics, as we vary parameters, we rarely have level crossing because levels repel. We can have level crossing only when there is a new symmetry and the two states are in a multiple, multi, in a, the same multiplet of an enhanced symmetry at this point, and that's what we see here. So the fact that we have level crossing or degeneracy at theta equals pi is a consequence of the fact that suddenly there's another symmetry, this C, and as a result, we have two levels which are degenerate. We'll later see another example how we can get level crossing uh, for a different reason. So let's discuss this anomaly in more detail and see how it comes about. So we said that whenever there is a global symmetry, we should couple the system to a background gauge field. So we're talking about the U1 symmetry, and we couple it to a U1 gauge field, A, so A is a U1 gauge field. So wherever we see Q dot, we write Q dot plus A, such so that it is gauge invariant. We also do it in this term. And here there's a new object that can happen. Since we write a gauge invariant Lagrangian for A, we can add a term linear in A. This can be thought of as a churn simons term in quantum mechanics. And as a result, the coefficient K here has to be an integer. It can be interpreted to say that along the world line, along this time, or Euclidean time, there is a Wilson line with charge k for the symmetry. So this thing appears in the exponent, so we have e to the i k a. So that's the holonomy around the circle, and we can stick an arbitrary parameter k here. So we refer to such a term as a counter term. Now, once a is non-zero, the periodicity of theta is modified. Originally, we had two pi periodicity of theta. That appeared in the first slide when I discussed this system. But now we see, because of this term here, that if we shift theta by 2 pi, the Lagrangian does not go to itself unless we also shift k by 1. That's just followed from this Lagrangian. So the parameter space, which was originally just a circle theta, now becomes a helix. The parameter is labeled by theta, which is a circle, and an integer k, but it's not the integer k times the circle, but the parameter space is a helix. So as we move with theta by 2 pi, we come back not to where we started, we come back shifted by an integer. And this is related to the fact that this spectrum is invariant under theta goes to theta plus 2 pi, but the states are rearranged. So as we gradually change theta by 2 pi, the state with label n is mapped to the state with label n plus 1. Now let's modify the system. So this system is exactly solvable. And I coupled it to all sorts of things and talked about level crossing, but this wasn't really necessary because we didn't just diagonalize the Hamiltonian, so what's the point? Instead, let's modify it and say add the potential cosine nq or any other periodic potential in such a way that we preserve a Zn symmetry. So now the system is no longer solvable, but it's still not that complicated. After all, it's just quantum mechanics of one degree of freedom. So now we have a Zn symmetry, the potential, and the qualitative picture is almost unchanged. Again, for generic C, or generic theta, 
we don't have another symmetry, but the theta multiple of pi, we have charge conjugation. So we have Zn, and we have also Z2 of charge conjugation. And now the story varies depending on whether n is even or odd. When n is even, we still have this anomaly at theta equals pi, and therefore there must be level crossing or two states must be degenerate there. This is an example of how anomaly allows us to say something without really solving the system. Of course, in field theory, it's more sophisticated. When n is odd, there is no such anomaly. There is no projective representation, but there is still degeneracy at theta equals pi. And there is a way to understand it as follows. Let's turn on the background field, and we would like to preserve the symmetry C. So there was a parameter k that we were allowed to tune. So the parameter, if we set the coefficient k to be n minus 1 over 2, this is still an integer when n is odd. And if we perform this charge conjugation symmetry, it is mapped to itself. So when n is odd, there is no anomaly, and this was referred to global inconsistency. I'll soon show that this is not really essential. So let's break the symmetries further. So we had some interplay. Between, we, originally, we had u1 in charge conjugation. Then we said, let's inst have zn instead of u1. So it was already more generic. And now I also want to break the charge conjugation symmetry. So now we have very little. So I can add more terms to break the charge conjugation symmetry. I would not bother to write it down. So now the symmetry is only zn. It looks like the system is getting more and more complicated and more and more generic. But we still have essentially the same story. So we add the Zn background field, and we can still add this counter term with Ka. A, K is an integer modulo n. And we still have this helix, except that now K is an integer modulo n. So there are only n values. So the helix comes back to itself after n revolutions. So the parameter space is still this helix. And... What we can see here is that every state has some Zn charge. It's an integer modulo n telling us how it transforms under the Zn. And as we crank theta up, because of this shift, a state with charge L is shifted to a state with charge L plus 1. So somewhere along the way, two levels have to cross. So if we shift theta by 2 pi, the spectrum will have to go to itself. But when we keep track also of the Zl charge, we see that somewhere, not necessarily at theta equals pi, two levels have to cross. And that's surprising because now, unlike the previous case, there is no symmetry reason for the level crossing. The only reason there is level crossing, the two states cross, and they do not repel each other as they normally do in quantum mechanics. And the reason for that is they transform differently under the Zn charge. So there cannot be any mixing between the two states. Using quantum field theory language, level crossing is what we call a phase transition. So the analog of that in quantum field theory will be a more sophisticated example that as we vary the parameters, we vary theta, there is a phase transition. Something non-trivial must happen. The ground state jumps from being one state to another. And now we see that it follows. We basically broke all the symmetry. We had U1 and charge conjugation. Most of it is irrelevant. We have time reversal, all that is irrelevant. What is relevant is that there is a Zn symmetry and that as we move by theta, we have to change the value of k. So we had this uh, helix structure, and as a result of this helix in the parameter space, we have level crossing. So we have two views on that. One of them is to say theta is not 2 pi periodic. That's the end of the story. Theta is 2 pi n periodic. Because after n revolutions, the helix goes back to itself. Or we could say that theta is 2 pi periodic, but it violates the Zn symmetry. This already sounds a lot like an anomaly. An anomaly is usually the case that you make a list of requirements on your, on your theory, on your quantum field theory or quantum mechanics, but then you realize that you can't satisfy all of them. Although classically you can, quantum mechanically you cannot satisfy all the requirements, and you have to sacrifice something. So here, either we sacrifice this or you sacrifice that. So we would like to interpret that as a generalized anomaly, a mixed anomaly between the Zn global symmetry and the 2 pi periodicity of theta. Now, for physicists, this should be very surprising because an anomaly is a problem with symmetries. It's not a problem 
in identifying the points in the parameter space. There is no symmetry in shifting theta by 2 pi. It's not a global symmetry of the system. It just says the parameter space, one value is the same as another. So this is surprising that we have an anomaly which is not related to a symmetry. And so we have to generalize the notion of anomalies to include such anomalies between parameter space and hence, or the coupling constant, hence the title of the talk, and that ZN symmetry. And as always with anomalies, the whole formalism of anomalies can just be copied in this case. An anomaly is described by a classical field theory of one dimension higher. And in this case, this classical field theory is, we had quantum mechanics, this is one dimension, so the one dimension higher is a two-dimensional field theory, and it's this one, and we'll soon define it a little bit more carefully. So continuing, we're talking about this uh, anomaly. It's an anomaly between the ZN symmetry or the U1 symmetry and the theta periodicity. And we have two complementary applications. One is viewing it as a one parameter, viewing the, system, the anomaly as a problem in a one parameter family of theories as we vary theta by two pi. And the second is a result, what happens is the parameter theta varies in space time. In this case, we have only time. So if we view the system as a one parameter family, what we learn from this anomaly is that there must be level crossing. So without doing any computation, we know that somewhere as we vary theta, two levels must cross. From a more field theoretic view, this is what a, an application of what is called the two anomaly matching condition. The full theory has this anomaly, this one, and the low energy observer should also reproduce the same anomaly. And the low energy observer sees only one state, Right? Low energy observer doesn't have enough energy to move up. This is only the ground state. And the, with one state, you cannot reproduce this anomaly. And if you cannot reproduce the anomaly with one state, something will have to give. And what gives is that there must be a phase transition somewhere. So it's somewhere at some value of theta, at least at one point, there must be two states so that the low energy observer sees that something is wrong. And by doing that, to saturate this uh, anomaly. The second application is to study interfaces, and I put interfaces in quotation marks because we have only time, so it's an interface in Euclidean time. It's not an interface in space. Later, we will also have interfaces in space. But in order to define interfaces and see their properties, we have to study the theory a little bit more carefully. So we need to define what we mean by this term, theta q dot. So this is what, how we started. Theta was independent of time, and then we had only q dot. So then there was no problem. But now we allow theta to depend on Euclidean time. And the key point is that theta is also circle valued. So if theta is circle valued, this thing is not well defined. So we need to define it more carefully. And the mathematicians already know how to do that, but this would be a physicist's lowbrow way of saying it. So we are going to divide the Euclidean circle into patches, and in every patch, theta is a map to R. And across transition functions, where we jump, theta jumps by 2 pi times an integer. And therefore, we define that as an integral on each patch, plus a correction factor whenever we jump by an integer. So we, it's easy to check that this is independent of trivialization. You can change your patches, and that doesn't change the answer. The key point is this correction factor. It's invariant under shifting q by 2 pi and under shifting theta by 2 pi. So that's a good definition. But here is the interesting thing that we learn is that if theta winds around the circle, if theta has non-trivial winding around the circle and q has non-trivial winding around the circle, then this point is, breaks the U1 symmetry. In other words, just by defining more carefully what we mean by theta q dot, we see that we lost the U1 symmetry, or if it's Zn, we lost the Zn. So this system, despite appearance, for constant theta has the global symmetry, but when we broaden our view and we consider configurations of theta that can wind, then the system does no longer have the global U1 symmetry, and this is our anomaly. Our anomaly is the statement that when theta is circle-valued, we should consider also configurations where theta winds, and then we lost the U1 symmetry. This is, again, the hallmark of an anomaly. 
So we can study three kinds of interfaces, and that's also true in the field theory examples. Every one of these statements I make here on this quantum mechanical system has counterpart in the more interesting field theoretic examples. We can let theta vary in a continuous smooth way. So since theta is smooth, there is a universal answer, universal in the technical sense. It's completely meaningful answer that follows from the Lagrangian. The second possibility is that cha theta changes abruptly. So we move with one value of theta up to one point, and then we jump to another value. Now, since theta jumps here, we might as well put another operator at that point, and that tells us that the answer is not unique. But with a very special operator, if we just insert here e to the i m q with integer q, then this interface is transparent. That's what we said before. These are these two patches. This is one patch, this is the other. Theta jumps by 2 pi m, but then we put also e to the i m q, and as a result, this interface is transparent. So let's see what happens when we have a smooth interface. So theta is constant over time, then moves very rapidly but smoothly to 2 pi m, and then continues, 2 pi, and then continues. So if theta jumps by 2 pi m, we can use what in quantum mechanics textbooks is called the sudden approximation. So we evolve with the ordinary Hamiltonian up to here, and now there's a rapid change. The Hamiltonian changes, and then we continue with another theta. So the states here are mapped to the state n plus m, and then we continue the evolution as if nothing happened. So that is achieved by multiplying the wave function by e to the i m q, and this means that the interface carries charge m. So again, we see the same thing. Whenever theta jumps by 2 pi m, that region of space, or space in this case it's only time, this region on time carries charge m under the symmetry, and by doing that violates the global symmetry of the problem. Now, so far I emphasize the fact that this is an anomaly in coupling constant space, not in a symmetry, but in this particular case we can also view it as a symmetry, but symmetry with quotation marks. So normally we discuss anomalies associated with global symmetries, zero form, one form, two form global symmetries. This is slightly more technical, but it's still true. And this anomaly can be viewed as an anomaly in the minus one form symmetry, using intuition from string theory. In string theory, we have symmetries and we have brains, and we also discuss minus one brain. A minus one brain is not really a brain, it's an instanton, it's an instance in space-time. It does not couple to a symmetry because just as it's not really a brain, there isn't an associated symmetry, but we can, if we think of the instantons as brains, we can think of it as being associated with a minus one global symmetry. And then we can think of theta as being the gauge field and it has transition functions in Z. And D theta is like the field strength and then all these formulas follow the standard treatment of anomalies. So this is kind of to connect to something we know. We will later see examples where I do not know of such an interpretation in terms of what we, a generalized notion of a symmetry. So, so far for quantum mechanics, I've passed half my time, and so it's time to move on. But we'll move on gradually. We'll move to one plus one dimensional field theory. So consider a U1 gauge theory in two dimensions. This system has been beaten to death over the last several decades. So we have n scalar fields, phi i, we charge one, and we have a potential, V of phi square, and we just impose that the potential is SUN invariant, so it rotates the different phi's. And we also include the theta term, this one for the dynamical U1 gauge field, little a. And we are not going to assume any charge conjugation or anything, and we can throw in more fields and break more symmetries as long as we impose just this SUN. So the key point is that the global symmetry of this system, although we impose SUN, the global symmetry of the system is PSUN. In other words, the center of SUN multiplies all the phi's by nth root of unity, but that's already included in the U1 gauge group, and therefore it does not act on gauge invariant operators. We also say that the global symmetry that is SUN, but it doesn't act faithfully on the operators. The symmetry that acts faithfully is PSUN. And the topology is going to come through this PSUN. So we couple the system to a background gauge field, denoted by big B. 
So always in this talk and in all my notes, uppercase is a classical gauge field and lowercase is a dynamical one. So that's to keep distinction. Classical means that we don't integrate over them. So we have this U1 gauge theory and we couple it to a PSUN gauge field B. And now the PSUN might or might not be an SUN back, the PSUN background field might or might not be an SUN background field. And there's some second cohomology with ZN values, W2 of B, which measures the obstruction to lifting it. And just as before we could add the term proportional to A, this counter term, now we also can add such a term with coefficient k, and k is an integer modulo n. And again, we have this modified periodicity. Now theta is not 2 pi periodic, but instead, if we shift theta by 2 pi, we have to shift this k by 1. I'm not going into the details, but if you ask, I can give more details. So again, we have our helix. So as we vary theta by 2 pi, we don't come back to where we started, we come back to where we started up to changing the coefficient of this term that depends only on the classical fields. So again, this can be viewed as an anomaly, a mixed anomaly between the periodicity of theta and the global PSUN symmetry. And it can be described by a three-dimensional term. The theory is two-dimensional, so we describe it by a three-dimensional term. Whoops. And the three-dimensional term is this one. So it's again, the formalism is very much like the formalism of anomalies. We have a system with global symmetry and theta periodicity. And we, the anomaly is described by a three-dimensional theory. And now we can use it, as in the quantum mechanics example, and we can use it with the two applications. One, a one-parameter family of theories, and the other will be interfaces. So one-parameter family of theories, we vary theta, we have this anomaly. At theta equals zero, it's quite clear that the spectrum is gapped and trivial. So at theta equals zero, the spectrum is gapped and trivial. At theta equals two pi, it should also be gapped and trivial. But the anomaly tells us that somewhere, as we vary theta, there must be a phase transition between them. And in special cases, this phase transition was studied in a lot of detail. But now we see that we can prove that it's there for very generous considerations without using most of the input that goes to the regular discussions of these phase transitions, like time reversal, charge conjugation, special forms of the potential, and so forth. We can also add more degrees of freedom. The story remains robust. There must be a phase transition as we vary theta. Second, we can study interfaces. So in space, we vary theta. So now the interface does not have quotation mark. It's a real interface in space. So theta is, say, 0 in part of space, and then moves up to be 2 pi m. And we can even close it. And the anomaly tells us that there must be, so the system is gapped in the bulk, but there must be something non-trivial on the interface. And the interface must be in a projective representation of PSUN, and we also know which projective representation. It should be a projective representation with a nullity, if you wish, M. And there's a physical way of thinking about it due to Coleman, although he didn't quite do this problem. He said that when you have theta, you can think of it as background electric field. And as you crank the electric field too high, you can pair produce particles out of the vacuum. The particles are these phi quanta. You can produce them, send them out, and they screen theta and reduce it by 2 pi. So what we have here is we produced m such particles out of the vacuum. And since the phi quanta are in the fundamental representation of SUN, the interface carries m units of SUN. So therefore, it must be in some SUN representation with a nullity m, and hence the anomaly. There was a question here? Uh, well, physicists refer to it as a stifle whitney class, but I'm told it's called, it should better be called Bauer class. No, no, it's not of the spin, of the, it's of, not of the tangent bundle, it's of the PSUN bundle. And hence the terminology is confusing. Physicists often use the same terminology, both for the tangent bundle and for, yeah. So I wrote the paper with a mathematician and physicist, and we had footnotes referring to the two terminologies. <laughs> so 
So that's what I wanted to say about two-dimensional gauge theories. I really can't resist showing some results about four dimensional so showing some results about four-dimensional gauge theory, so I'll just flash them rapidly. So we're interested in an SUN four-dimensional gauge theory, and it has what is called a ZN one-form global symmetry associated with the center of the group, which means that we should also study PSUN bundles that are not SUN bundles, but in the functional integral, we do not sum over them. We specify, again, such a class, I said it's called the Bauer class, I understand. It's the obstruction to lifting it to an, a, to an SUN bundle. And we have to sum over all of them. And the partition function is parameterized as by this B. And again, we have such an anomaly. We have a mixed anomaly between this one form symmetry and theta. And since we are in a four dimensional gauge theory, it is written in terms of a five dimensional integral written like that, where the Pontryagin square is well-defined mod n or mod 2n, depending on whether or n is odd or even. The details are not important. The important thing is that we have some anomaly as a function of theta. And as a result, we can, again, use the same machinery, the same machinery we use in quantum mechanics, and learn that we can also break more symmetries, time reversal, Edmore fields, it doesn't matter, as long as you preserve that symmetry. As a result, we learned that various phase transitions should occur, and there should be some topological field theories on various interfaces. So this is one example. This was first constructed in the string construction by Achaira and Waffa. They showed that in n equals one four-dimensional SUN gauge theories, there are domain walls, and there's a churn simons theory or topological field theory on the interface. This was later interpreted in the paper with Gayotto, Kapustin, and Willett, is associated with the mixed anomaly between some global symmetries. And now we see that we don't even need the other symmetries. The topological field theory has to be there because of this anomaly, which uses very little, does not use this Zn or Z2n R symmetry. So it's again, the result is much more robust. We can break some of the, even some of the symmetry that we use to derive it, and the result is still true. Also, even without supersymmetry, there is a mixed anomaly between time reversal and uh, the one-form symmetry. And as a result, there must be a phase transition at theta equals pi. This is the old, maybe I should say a little bit older result. Again, there must be a phase transition there, and there are domain walls and so forth. Now we see that we can derive all these results without ever mentioning the time reversal symmetry, which was kind of the hero of the story in this paper. So this paper is from a few years ago where we discussed time reversal symmetry and there was an anomaly and so forth. Now we can do, we derive the same result without ever mentioning the time reversal symmetry. So we can even break the symmetry and the result is still true. And we have some non-trivial topological field theories on interfaces. And again, we have the three kinds of interfaces. We have smooth interfaces. We have interfaces that are discontinuous and therefore not universal, and we have these transparent ones. So I don't want to get into all the details, it's getting more and more technical, and we can throw more and more fields and consider more complicated examples, but I would like to end with an example which is again free and solvable, but it has a somewhat different flavor. And this is a free massive vial fermion in four dimensions. This is the simplest fermion we can have in four dimensions. And the first thing we need to identify is the parameters. So the parameter is a complex mass. So we can put a complex mass term in the Lagrangian. This is exactly solvable and was, I think there are maybe 100,000 papers written on this system, both in math and in physics. This thing was really beaten to death. But surprisingly, we can still say a little bit new. So the parameter space is the complex mass plane. And we can think of identifying the point at infinity because after all the fermion is infinitely massive so who cares what the phase of the mass is so we can think of it as being compact and in fact we can also remove the phase of the m because if we redefine the phase of the mass by phase redefine the phase of the mass we can absorb it in a phase rotation of the fundamental fermion and that suffers an anomaly in shifting the lagrangian by a term like that proportional to trace R wedge R. This is again well known for decades. 
nothing new here. And as above, as I only called the previous examples, here we have to, to formulate the theory not in flat space, but with having some non-trivial curvature. And if we have non-trivial curvature, we might as well add a local counter term. So we can add another counter term. In this case, it's continuous. It's not a discrete. So we can add such a counter term. It's a gravitational theta angle, very common in the literature. So the free fermion, we can add such a term. And now we see that when we discussed the parameter space, we had the complex mass m, and we had a, this theta parameter, and we have identification by such a rotation. So the partition function, if I just rotate the mass by a phase, is not invariant unless I also shift the value of this parameter. So for non-zero mass, there's really no problem. As long as the mass is non-zero, I can remove the phase by absorbing the phase of the mass in such a term proportional to our wage r. But I can't do that when m is zero. And again, we can view it as an anomaly. And the mixed anomaly is between the fact that we have the parameter mass scale m and this theta parameter. And we can write it as a five-dimensional term. And here it is. So this is the five-dimensional term. So we have delta 2 of m times d2m times the gravitational trans-Simons term, and it's common in theories of anomalies. It's called descent procedure. We write a theory in one dimension higher, and sometimes we write the theory with two dimension higher, and then we can write it in this form. So this is a six-dimensional field theory. Classical field theory depends only on the mass and the curvature. So this is the six-dimensional field theory, and we see that it's non-trivial. And since this field theory is non-trivial, we use, again, our applications. And there are two kinds of applications. One, it's a family of field theories labeled by M. And the second is defects. So application number one, now we see the problem not in a one-parameter family of theories, but in a two-parameter family of theories. Before, we had it with theta, that as we vary theta, there must, be a phase, there must have been a phase transition somewhere. Now we have two parameters, it's a complex mass. So it's somewhere on the complex mass plane, something will have to be different. Well, in the free fermion, it's clear. This happens at m equals zero, where the fermion is massless. You don't need this complicated machinery to see that. But now we see that if we modify the system, add gauge interactions and more scalar fields and the potential, and make it much more complicated, this argument is robust. And still somewhere in the complex m plane, something will not be trivial. So the theory will be, can be gapped and trivial for generic M, but somewhere there must be something special, and in this case, it is a, the massless fermion. The second application is defects. We let the mass be position dependent, for example, depending on X and Y plane. So let the mass be X plus IY. So the phase of the mass rotates at infinity, and the mass has to go to zero somewhere in the interior, say at the origin. This problem was first studied by Jakiv and Rossi, and there is huge literature following their work. And now we just look at this anomaly. We integrate this D2M on the XY plane, and we are left with our wage R, telling us that the theory along the defect must have a gravitational anomaly, this our wage R, and we can even get the coefficient from here. And that tells us that the theory along the defect has C left minus C right equals a half. So in the case of the free fermion, we can actually solve it. There are fermion zero modes along the defect, and there's an index theorem that guarantees that they are there. And as a result, we have massless fermions. But now we see that this in index theorem is a manifestation of the same anomaly formula. So the same anomaly can be viewed different ways, either this part of the anomaly, maybe I should point here, this part of the anomaly is in our four-dimensional space-time, and this reflects an anomaly. Or we say this is our four-dimensional space-time, and this tells us what happens as we vary m. So there are two ways of thinking about this anomaly, and they agree. So let me summarize. Uh, to study quantum field the ordinary symmetries, it's common to couple the system to background fields, and then anomalies are very powerful. 
And in general, this, this is a lot of literature on anomalies, their studies, how the, form, the formalism works and what the applications are, and many of them. And we describe it usually by a high dimensional classical field theory for the background fields A. And the novelty here is that we throw into the mix also the coupling constant. It's not just the gauge fields A, but we throw into the mix also the, all the coupling constant lambda. And now we can have more terms that we can write down. There could be more anomalies, and we call them anomalies in the space of coupling constants. And again, this is described by a higher dimensional field theory, which depends on all the background fields, which are coupling constants, gauge fields, metric, etc. And this anomaly is invariant under renormalization group flow. And as a result, we have res exact results about the long distance behavior. We computed the short distances. <clears throat> we computed the short distances where it's easy to compute, and we learned consequences about the long distance theory. We deduced that there must be a phase transition, for example, in a complicated system. And we also studied defects where these parameters vary in space or in space time. And then there was an anomalous theory on the defect. In quantum mechanics, we showed that the defect necessarily carries charge. In one plus one dimensions, it carried the projective representation of the global symmetry group. And in higher dimensions, there were other effects there. <clears throat> and we presented various examples in various number of dimensions, quantum mechanics, two dimensions, and four. In the paper, we had papers, we also had examples in three dimensions and more examples in four. And we also studied theories with quarks. Not everything we studied is in the papers, but there are many more examples that we haven't studied. And I have no doubt that they will uncover new phenomena because this is really a new tool. So I'll stop here. Thank you. We have time for questions. <clears throat> so about this anomaly involving this mass parameters, so can you generalize it to also include global anomalies? Not just part of the anomaly. Yes, uh, you can. Um, there are various variants of it. So I did one vial fermion with a mass term that breaks the global U1 symmetry. If you have a Dirac fermion with a mass that preserves the U1 symmetry, you can do exactly what you asked and write a mixed anomaly between the U1 and the mass. And various papers that you wrote over the last few years can be rephrased in this language in a way that I hope is obvious to you. What's the question, Nikita, over there? Ah, that's very Can interesting. We, please repeat the question. The question was whether there are similar anomalies in the zero-two theory in six dimensions. The zero-two theory in six dimensions does not have parameters, and therefore I cannot play the... Sorry, that's a discrete thing, but there are no continuous parameters that I can vary and check whether things happen. But... If you consider, say, the one zero theory or the two zero theory, and you compactify down, there are parameters associated with the compactification, and they can get into this story. And some of that, the papers with Yonekura that I referred to do exactly this. So, yeah, so in this case, the parameters really started their lives as a, as a geometry, and therefore it's not a new anomaly. But the examples that I studied here, these are genuine parameters. They didn't start their life as in, in the geometry, and therefore there could be such anomalies. Yeah. I have a nice question. Can you give a physics exp explanation of what an invertible field theory is? Of? Of what invertible means in invertible field ah, theory. It, from my pers So this terminology was invented by Greg Moore and Dan Fried. Mm -hmm. So let me first define what they said. They said this is a topological field theory that has satisfies all the requirements of a topological field theory. And in addition, the partition function of every closed manifold is a non-zero number, hence the name invertible. And the Hilbert space, so if you slice it and it has a boundary, 
there is a state in the boundary, in the Hilbert space of the boundary theory, and the boundary theory, the Hilbert space is one-dimensional for any boundary. That's the definition. And I think in more lame terms, in more down-to-earth terms, this is a theory that depends only on classical fields, and you don't, classical in the sense that you don't integrate over them. So the partition function is e to the minus the action of these classical fields. And this could be subtle if this classical Lagrangian is not written as an integral of a local density, a local Lagrangian, but it's some characteristic class, which is just a number, which is not an integral of anything. This is as far as I can do, and I'm sure they can do much better explaining that. Thanks. Um, okay, so I don't see any further questions. Let's thank Natya again. Thank <laughs> you.